You can shut those doors. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> That's very good. It's probably, if you were up early, it was one of the most beautiful uh, Pittsburgh uh, uh, skies that you'll ever see this early in the morning for the early risers. I'm Mike Lyons. I run the uh, corporate banking business for uh, PNC, and we welcome you into our new building. It's a little under uh, two years old, and uh, I think we had maybe for three or four weeks uh, after spending hundreds of millions to get there, we had the greenest building in the world uh, for a very short period and then were uh, passed by someone who made a big news event out of it. When we first, uh, this auditorium is named after Jim Rohr, who if you're from Pittsburgh and you, and you know Jim, he's done extraordinary things for our city and our parks uh, and what was one, arguably one of the great leaders of, uh, in banking history. And uh, many people forget Philadelphia is really our second. Uh, Sean, our guest today, is from Philadelphia, and we're going to talk a lot about Philadelphia. But Philadelphia is really our second headquarters city. So we've done lots for the community in, in Philadelphia, too. But uh, Jim gets a lot of credit for what he's done here in Pittsburgh. But really, across our franchise, he's done some, some pretty extraordinary things. But funny line was when, we, uh, when the proposal first came in to build this building, they uh, brought it into Jim. And this is, we're going back eight or 10 years now. And maybe green buildings weren't as uh, on the forefront of the, the news every day as it is today. But the team came in and said, Jim, we want to build the greenest building in the world. And he said, absolutely no way, green is citizens' colors, which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we went back and, uh, and, and uh, uh, build things here. But we thank Jim for uh, uh, obviously honor, honor him with this auditorium and, and thank him for uh, all what he continues to do. And we're thrilled to host this, uh, host this event as PNC. We've got a long commitment to the Pittsburgh Parks and Service, the Hat Luncheon, grow up great, the classrooms up at the Frick Park uh, Center. If you haven't been up there, uh, it is a great place to go, especially if you have young kids like myself to kill energy and time. And, uh, and I serve on the Conservancy Board, which we're very proud uh, to do. We've got a great board uh, here, and it's a great time for us to have this conversation as, as we're, if people have looked at the website, we've put forth a new strategic plan uh, which is uh, ambitious in nature as any strategic plan uh, should be. Uh, uh, and then we're going through, uh, Meg's here in the front row, we're going to go through our first ever uh, leadership transition in the history of the Conservancy. So it's an important time for us to think uh, from a visionary uh, perspective, and, and we don't think there's any better person uh, to help us than Sean McCainy, who's the Executive Director the William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia, a uh, University of Pennsylvania graduate and Temple, but I'm a Penn grad, so we shared, uh, shared good memories about uh, parts of the city that weren't so safe uh, 25 years ago. But what's happened in the city specifically around this initiative of rebuilding uh, community infrastructure, or rebuild, has made uh, Philadelphia very much like Pittsburgh has transformed. Philadelphia has transformed in extraordinary ways. Uh, and just the b boundaries of the city uh, when I was in school in the early 90s versus what it is uh, today, you wouldn't even recognize it's almost two different places. Uh, so a lot of credit what's happened in, in, uh, in Philadelphia and, and the rebuild effort that you're going to hear about today, uh, if we think our strategic plan is ambitious, this is uh, incredibly uh, ambitious and, and give a lot of credit to the city for what they're going to do. And the William Penn Foundation in terms of we've, we think we've, uh, and we, the, we would put ourselves up against any city in terms of the quality of foundations here in Pittsburgh and, and William Penn and um, what they've done for Philadelphia. A hundred million dollar commitment uh, to this effort uh, is extraordinary leadership and, and you should be very uh, proud, uh, Sean. The, um, we, uh, uh, and, and the history of the William Penn, which you hear uh, maybe you'll go through today, Sean, is uh, lots of support for, for public places and, and parks, so shares of a lot of the uh, philosophy and, and grounding that our uh, foundations here in the city do and, and, and really what makes uh, uh, the city special. Uh, in conjunction with the Conservancy, we want to acknowledge and thank our, our co-sponsor in this event, the Pennsylvania Urban Parks and Recreation Alliance, great partnership we've had over time and, and very proud uh, to support this event today. So thank you for coming. Uh, be pr very proud of what we've done in Pittsburgh, uh, but see something very different uh, and exciting and, and ambitious uh, from what Sean's going to tell you. So Sean, without uh, further ado, the stage is yours and uh, enlighten us. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat>
Well, well thank you. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, I want to first thank Meg Cheever, your amazing executive director, and Dan Booker, your amazing chairman, for, for hosting me and having me out here. As I said to Meg and Dan last night, I never decline an invitation to come to Pittsburgh. And you, you, you all don't need me to tell you what an amazing city you have here. And I'm pretty partisan, right? I'm a Philly guy, I'm very partisan, but there's so many things I admire about Pittsburgh. Your amazing philanthropic community, the Allegheny Conference, you're a national leader in historic preservation. We, we claim to be the oldest, the most historic city in America, but you are the national leaders in historic preservation. So, so many things to admire, and topography. I mean, as a flatlander, I just, I just love your topography. But, um, so, um, wanted to start off with, um, well, first let me say, in, uh, as Mike was saying, uh, um, relating to uh, headquarters cities. Um, you know, I, I love Pittsburgh so much that I, I said to Meg and Dan last night, if, if we don't win the Amazon headquarter contest, I hope you do. <laughs> and, and am I, well, am I the only person in this room who believes that Dan Be uh, Je Jeff Bezos has his mind already made up and that this is an extraordinary marketing and leverage opportunity? <laughs> well, well, good luck and uh, good luck to us. Uh, so just to start off, just to talk a little bit about uh, who the William Penn Foundation is. Uh, the first thing to understand is we were not founded by William Penn. Uh, people <laughs> still come up to me and say, did William Penn put aside 100 shillings in 1700 to create the foundation? He didn't. We are, we are, we are, we are uh, of more recent vintage. We were founded by the Roman Haas Chemical Company, which had the great good fortune of inventing plexiglass on the eve of World War II. So every bomber that went to Europe or the South Pacific had a plexiglass nose cone in it. And that was the basis of, 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 the, of the company's fortune. Today, we're, we're a $2.5 billion foundation that makes about $110 million a year in grants around three areas. We have a big focus on early education. We're interested in supporting the development of strong readers and strong learners, especially in the early grades. Our environmental team works across four states and 14,000 square miles trying to protect the water quality of the Delaware River, which is the source of drinking water for 15 million people. And our creative communities team, which I led prior to coming to the foundation, is focused on expanding access to the arts to all Philadelphians and access to high quality public spaces with a theme of, of promoting shared civic experiences and engagement. So to start off with, uh, the first thing I'd, I, I would like to point out that, you know, the size of the grant gets a lot of attention. That was intentional, right? We wanted to make a big statement about the importance of this program. And up, and up until recently, it was number three uh, now it's number two, but I just read that uh, Diller Island is back on the map, that uh, that project had to resurface. So for, for a brief period of time, it was tied for second place, the largest grant in, for parks and public space. The point I, I'd like to make, though, is that a lot of those mega, mega grants are about big signature parks. Our grant is about an investment in a system of neighborhood parks and public spaces. And the, our aim is to create a model for community investment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So before I get into the mechanics of Rebuild, I want to talk about some of the, the conditions that existed to help set the stage for, and made Rebuild possible. The first is, um, as, as Mike was mentioning, Philadelphia's downtown has gone through an amazing renaissance over, over the last 30 years. It had the dual effect of two things. One, it made the case that investing in civic assets can be transformative. On the other hand, it demonstrated that the city had been focusing too much, almost exclusively in downtown at the expense of the rest of the city. Um, secondly, we had a role to play. In 2012, we launched a new public space grant making program that produced, that, that uh, generated or, or provided a new source of public space funding in the city. And our, and our work was, nudged, was, was to nudge the city into thinking about areas beyond downtown in terms of public space. And finally, most importantly, we got a new mayor in uh, 2016 who brought in a bold agenda and an amazing leadership team that really has created uh, the Rebuild program. So just to begin with, um, um, in January of 2015, the New York Times released its annual 52 places to go uh, in the world. Every, every year they did it. And Philadelphians opened their Sunday New York Times and found that Philadelphia was ranked number three, which is unprecedented that, that the New York Times ever wrote something nice about Philadelphia. <laughs> and, it was shocking to us. And number one was Milan, and number two was Cuba, and Cuba's a whole country, right? <laughs> but but the, the, the most gratifying thing about this recognition was it was all about public space. Everything that the article mentioned referred to the, 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 the renovation of, down, of Center City's public realm, its public spaces and parks and downtown spaces. Um, it's, it's also obviously part of this 
larger renaissance of downtown, which has been you know, really, really amazing. A huge amount of new development in, in, in Philadelphia, Center City, big growth in population. Uh, but we would make the case, though, that the public space wasn't a part of the renaissance of downtown. It helped initiate it. It helped trigger it. It was a big part of it. Renovating and repairing and actually creating new public spaces all through downtown had a huge effect. It, it, it enhanced the brand of the city. It made Philadelphia seem like a different place, as, as Mike was mentioning. Uh, for residents, it, it's, it, it represented tangible signs of improvement. The city was changing after many years and many decades of decline. And it was exactly the right set of amenities for the kind of people who were moving into Philadelphia. Young, young families, millennials, and empty nesters were looking for these kind of amenities. But as I said earlier, it really shined a light on the disparity between what was happening in downtown and the rest of Philadelphia. Um, as I mentioned, 20, in 2012, our foundation began the process of a new strategic plan. And in the prior 10 years, we had been part of that, so part of supporting the renaissance of downtown. We invested $25 million just in those 10 years in, in center city public spaces. And our board said it was time to think about building on that success and moving out of downtown and engage, begin to engage the neighborhoods beyond center city. Uh, neighborhoods that are in some ways changing as a result of, of the uh, renaissance of, of, of downtown. And we created a, a, a geographically targeted public space investment program. Again, building on the success of center city, but beginning to expand it outward. And we identified 17 landscapes, 17 targeted landscapes for investment and over a period of years, and we're about halfway through those investments now. But the, the key point is that it was a, it's a, while the program is intended to engage neighborhoods outside of downtown, it's very incremental, right? We're sort of building from strength and moving out, but it does not engage the entire city, right? This, this, this just really is focused on the neighborhoods, you know, in the, in the greater downtown, or outside of greater downtown, we needed a bigger frame. We needed a bigger strategy if we were going to reach the entire city, and that is, the, that is what a rebuild provides. The biggest, the biggest change, of course, is leadership. Leadership is everything, and um, I often describe Mayor Kenny as having uh, one foot in the neighborhood, one foot in the future. He was a longtime popular at-large councilman in Philly. I think he was in office over 20 years, and at one point, I think he was the largest get vote getter of, out -large, of, at, of the out-large council people. Uh, he was swept into office with 85% of the vote. Sounds like he's very, he's similar to uh, Mayor Peduto, I, I suppose, in terms of a uh, broad base of support. The things, but you know, we really weren't sure what kind of mayor we were going to get. Right? He'd always been involved in progressive issues. He uh, w was a le leader on, on many interesting issues, but we didn't know what kind of mayor he would be. And I think me and, and many others were very surprised that we came into office about the bold agenda he established for his administration. Rebuild is just one part. Even he's, he's proposing an even bigger investment in universal pre-K, creating 6,000 new uh, pre-K seats in, in, in Philadelphia and 25 new community schools, all sort of the three legs of a big uh, emphasis on promoting equity. And, you know, he might not use that term equity, but I think he actually authentically believes in it. And he, he, he said many times, in a sort of visceral way, he's just embarrassed that the children of Philadelphia the citizens of the city have, you know, you know, deteriorated facilities when compared to what, you know, people downtown have or folks out in the suburbs especially. He always talks about uh, traveling Little League teams coming to Philadelphia and playing in deteriorated uh, ball fields. So, he, so he, really, he really believes it. But I think, my, my personal observation about him, though, is that he was a great student of the Nutter administration, the prior mayor. And while Mayor Nutter was, uh, you know, a, a, a globetrotting, uh, high-profile mayor, um, he wasn't as successful, I think, in, in many of the sort of the nuts and bolts of government. And um, Mayor Kenny has done three things. First, he created a really strong relationship with city council, with, which Mayor Nutter did not enjoy. He also created a very strong management team, which, again, something that, that Mayor Nutter didn't create. But he also kept uh, all of Mayor Nutter's best people. His, his, it's interesting, when, when Mayor Nutter came into office, he brought in like a, 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 an all-star team, people from all over the country. Mayor Kenny's administration are all people he knows. They're all people known to him. It's a very local, mostly local administration. And one of the people he kept was Mike DeBerdinas, my favorite Marxist. Um, Mike, Mike is a personal mentor to me. I've been working with him since he was Secretary of DCNR. Um, 
He's really, he's really the big thinker of the administration. He's a, he's a strategist. But better than that, he's the kind of strategist who can translate strategy into action. He knows how to make things happen. And, you know, the thing to say about Mike is he, his roots are in community organizing. And so everything is about organizing to Mike. $500 million of capital, Mike sees that. Not, not, it's not a bricks and mortar program. It's an organizing program. So he sees rebuild really in terms of being a way to re-engage the entire city, to empower neighborhoods, to organize communities for action. So it's, it's about engagement, and his, his idea is that rebuild will, will, will represent a new compact with residents, that the city will have a role, that residents will have a role, working together to uh, steward and maintain these new improvements. His successor was the amazing is the amazing Catherine Ott Lovell, who was previously head of the Fairmount Park Conservancy and, became, and came, became Parks and Rec Commissioner under Kenny. Amazing leader, gifted leader, uh, and transformed the Fairmount Park Conservancy into something that almost is almost as good as Pittsburgh's Park Conservancy. Uh, not quite. You guys are a great model for us. We're getting there. You know, we, we, need, we need to find a Meg cheaper. Meg, you're, you've got time, right? You're, you're, and she's, and she's doing the same thing with, with the city's uh, Parks and Rec Department, transforming that culture. Finally, the last uh, major implementer of, of the leadership team is our one non-local person, our, our, our amazing librarian, Siobhan Reardon, who used to head the Queens uh, Public Library. She was Librarian of the Year, and she has an astonishing vision for our library system. We have 54 branches uh, throughout the city, and in many neighborhoods, Schools have closed, the churches have closed, there's a contraction of public spaces, but the branches are still out there. The library branches are still beacons of service, and she's transforming all of them into portals, portals of community service that are designed to have a service mission that matches the needs of the communities in which they are located. A little, <clears throat> uh, a little fact is that before we made our $100 million grant, our largest grant was $25 million to the library back in 2013 to advance her mission around transforming libraries into, uh, into community-oriented uh, portals. So, it's so now it's time to jump into um, <coughs> the mechanics of rebuild. This is the vision that the mayor has established. Um, and it's very simple. The mayor feels like every resident should have access to high-quality public spaces, parks, and recreation facilities. And there, <clears throat> some of the other goals of, of, the, of the program include, you know, uh, supporting economic development, especially inclusive, um, inclusiveness for uh, the workforce. But from the very beginning, when, when, when um, uh, we were approached by the city to help think about rebuild, the mayor, Mike DeBerry, and us, we really wanted it to be a national model. We want Philadelphia to help show the way how cities can lead the way in thinking about reinvesting in communities. These are the three pillars of Rebuild. It's a capital program, parks, libraries, recreation centers, but it's also a workforce program. The Rebuild program itself won't create lots of jobs, but it will create opportunities for pathways for people to get into the workforce. And, you know, again, reflecting Mike's, you know, deep, deep interest in community empowerment engagement, it is an engagement program. So what's real, really different about Rebuild? Well, the first thing is it's, it's data-driven. It's not a political uh, allocation of resources. The aim is to ensure that resources are driven to the places of greatest need. And part of our early support was after uh, Mayor Kenny won the primary over the summer of 2015, <coughs> Mike DeBernis approached us and said, will you, and, and shared this idea with, 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 uh, with us, and asked us to help plan and develop rebuilds. So very quietly, between the, between the primary and the general election, we supported a, a $500,000 grant that, that really did the background planning for rebuild, that created the investment strategies so that when Mayor Kenny came to office, he had, a, he had the rough outlines of a plan. But it involved, uh, uh, unbelievably, the first comprehensive mapping of all our facilities. We had 12 maps. We had all kinds of databases, but no consolidated analysis of all 406 parks, recs, library facilities. And part of the analysis was trying to understand how to serve two goals. Um, the, and that, that, this slide is wrong. It says 50% of all funding is for equity. It's 75% of all funding is for equity. But the mayor established two key goals. He wanted to promote equity, but also use a small portion of the funding to leverage private investment in, in, and to advance uh, community stabilization. But for months, our, the planning team looked at data, analyzed the city, 
and try to establish a series of, of, of opportunities. For example, what facilities, in, what investments in facilities would promote the equity goal? What investment in facilities would leverage private development? The, this is, I'm getting into sort of the guts of, of why rebuild is different. And the, the first thing to understand is, and I'm sure that this is sh shocking to Pittsburgh, but um, when we allocate capital in Philadelphia, it's allocated equally across council districts. So there's 10 council districts, and everybody gets the same. It's a political decision, right? It's not a strategic decision. And so what happens is count this, the 10th council district up in the far northeast, which has relatively fewer facilities that are mostly new, gets the same amount of money as the 5th, which has many, many more facilities that are older. So the 5th never catches up, and the 10th just keeps getting better. So that, while from a political standpoint, it seems that there's equity and that everyone gets the same, the current approach really reinforces inequity. Um, so this is the most exciting slide, so I want you all to pay attention. <laughs> don't, don't miss this. Um, this does, I know this isn't earth-shattering, but this is, this, is, this, is the, this is the effect of rebuild and this, this switch from a political to a strategic uh, approach to investment. On the left, so <clears throat> the first round of rebuild projects, are, there's 60 projects in that first round. Um, we, uh, uh, the, 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 the program is gonna be financed, I'll get in a second, it's gonna be uh, financed through a series of bonds. We're gonna sell $100 million every other year. The first 60 projects have been identified and under the current capital allocation program, it would have looked like the left chart. Everybody gets exactly the same. But under rebuild, you'll see that you're starting to see the tenth will only get two, but the fifth will get nine. So you're, you're, you're seeing a real shift from this sort of equalized political approach to a more strategic investment. And that, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, an appreciation understanding that under rebuild, some folks will get more and some folks will get less, but it's based on data and need, not just a, a political arrangement. This is the breakdown of costs. In terms of sources, we are gonna finance it through $300 million in new bonds, which will be financed through a sweet and beverage tax, which I'll mention in a moment. We're contributing 100 million, Regular city capital over the life of the program is about 48 million, and then we have to raise an additional 52 million. And some of that 52 will come from state sources, other private sources, and I'll talk about that as well. But the breakdown is that uh, in terms of, of, for example, construction, half the funding will go to um, support the equity goal, 70% toward that uh, uh, leveraging investment goal. This is the delivery mechanism. And it is as complicated as it looks like. And I, this is, we were not involved in, or didn't, we're, we're not participating in, in the discussion about how to deliver rebuild. And this is the part of the program that, I'll be honest, gives me the most concern. You see this box is called project user. So that, th think of those as really project managers. And think of this as sort of a distributed approach to project delivery. The way rebuild's gonna work is, Project users, which are essentially nonprofit organizations like the Fairmount Park Conservancy, the Free Library Foundation, LISC, community development organizations, will apply for funding to do projects on that 60 project list. So it's a very, it's, it's again, not probably what I would have recommended, but it is, it is the approach. And there are advantages to it as well, especially in terms of working with organizations that are, that are very close to the communities in which they are located. But it, it is, it is uh, very complex, and we'll, we'll, you know, it will be interesting to see how it, uh, how it goes forward. Um, so, a little bit about the, uh, the famous sweetened beverage tax. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing about it is it, it's, this is the third try. This is Philadelphia's third try at a sweetened beverage tax. It failed twice before. And... Um, you know, I, I, I think um, Mayor Kennedy doesn't even do justice to the story about how he succeeded. But as I mentioned, he had very good, he, he, he started, his, started in office with trying to develop a really good relationship with a city council. And <clears throat> the, the genius of his approach to the sweet beverage tax was to tie it to very specific things that everyone would see benefit. And in the case of rebuild, for example, every city council person will see millions of dollars invested in their districts. The prior approach was um, 
it's, this is a way to attack childhood, childhood obesity. We got, we got, a, we got a, uh, d uh, reduce um, soda consumption, and, we're, and we will use the revenue, in, the revenue will go to the general fund, right? No one saw any direct benefit to them. But um, Mayor Kenny, you know, again, studying carefully the prior two failed uh, attempts, saw that it was essential that people understood where that funding directly was going to go. And he linked it to a series of issues for which there was already very strong advocacy, parks, pre-K, and community schools. It passed 13 to 4 in city council, um, but not without opposition, right? Uh, in just, in, our understanding is in just the, the uh, roll-up to the city council vote that the beverage industry spent $10 million opposing it. Uh, we spent much less supporting it and really relied on a lot of grassroots advocacy provided by those organizations that were already in place. Uh, and the opposition continues. Um, early, early on, uh, the beverage industry um, marketed it as a grocery tax, which I'm not sure was completely effective. I think it may have confused people more than anything. But uh, right now, it, uh, but they, they uh, appealed the decision in, um, uh, in court. Uh, it has survived two court challenges. It's now uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, we have a special, we have to, we have to thank Pittsburgh especially for this. Commonwealth Court here in Pittsburgh gave us a five to two decision, a very strong decision in favor of the, favor of the tax. Our hope is that the Supreme Court will just confirm the lower tier court rulings, but we, uh, we don't know yet. We'll, we'll, we'll hopefully learn soon. Um, so my, my personal nickname for Philadelphia, my private one, the one I use out of town, is <laughs> Councilvania, uh, or the city of 10 mayors. And, um, um, it's probably an exaggeration to call city council the Game of Thrones or, or to compare, compare it to. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we, have, we have something called councilmatic prerogative in Philadelphia, which means every councilman is a king. You, you essentially have 10 mayors. A, 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 anything that happens in a council district must be approved by that district uh, member. And, any, and whenever a council district uh, member proposes something, all the rest of council supports it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's everyone is sort of a reciprocal arrangement. The challenge is, as you can imagine, is that it really is an obstacle to, to big thinking. It's hard to you know, advance strategic, big strategic ideas. And it's not new, but it seems to accelerate recently that there's a struggle between city council and the mayor, who's, who's in charge, who's, who, who runs the city, and real confusion about executive and legislative roles. And one of the challenges that we've experienced with Rebuild that I wanted to share is, is that the, the people who really stand politically to benefit the most, city you know, council district members, have uh, resisted the program and tried to assert control over it and take it, take it over. Um, so that's, it's again, a symptom of this long range, ongoing war between the mayor and city council. And we, we have tried to use our funding as a way to preserve the strategic integrity of the program to say that if the program turns into a, you know, a council free-for-all, we would, you know, that would not be uh, in line with our interests of supporting the program, which again, we wanted to establish a more strategic model. Uh, we're not in this alone. Uh, we, we, uh, although we're the biggest funder, we uh, are working a partnership with our local philanthropic community to generate local philanthropic support for the program. We have some national funding already, but we're, we're really interested in, in getting small, medium uh, fund, local funders involved. And not, not, to gener not that we expect to generate a lot of money, but to generate the support, the moral support for the program. And a, a group of 12 local funders have organized themselves um, into a rebuild funders group. And they are the ambassadors of the program to the rest of the funding community. We are trying to support that by <coughs> offering a 50% match. If you put a dollar into Rebuild, we'll put 50 cents. And to, again, to stimulate other philanthropic interests. And we're staffing this effort at the local um, affinity group. But the idea is how can, you, how can you create a menu of investments, a place where all funders, a small family foundation, an individual donor can see themselves. Because it's a, it's a big program, it can be very overwhelming. So we're trying to create a structure and infrastructure that makes it easy for people to engage and to support the program. So I'll, <coughs> I'll wrap up with um, a few cautionary uh, thoughts. Um, um, so 
Top of the list, if we lose the sweetened beverage tax, there is no bond. And if there's no bond, there's no $100 million grant. That, that's how our, our grant is conditioned. There, we're not, our, grant, our $100 million grant is not conditioned on the tax, it's conditioned on the bond. Um, so there, there's a huge risk there. Um, we've never done it before. The program is big. I think, it, I think uh, research shows that it's the second largest public works project in the history of the state. I think the expansion of the convention center was number one. Uh, so it's, 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 it's huge in scale and scope. We haven't tried it before, and, it's, uh, and as I mentioned, it has a very complex delivery method, which keeps me up at night, frankly. Um, city Council, in their, in their rework, in their helpful amendments to the, uh, to the implementing legislation, increase the inclusion goals for the program, and they're very ambitious, and we're a city that has never delivered on our inclusion goals, so I, that's a point of, of concern for me. Continued city council interference can always be a problem. We 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 worry that that side deals will start emerging. There will be a breakdown in a in 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 the strategic nature of the program. And and you know, the mayor and his administration want to get it done. So you can imagine there there may be more willingness to compromise just to keep the program moving. Uh, if if Mayor Kenny leaves, I mean he's he is uh, he is assuming that this will uh, have a life expanding two. Um, um, two terms in office, uh, but he, you know, and I, and I, we, we assume he will continue in office, but that's not a certainty. And the other, the other, the other thing I kind of worry a little bit about is, is the, um, the delay in rolling out. You know, the mayor announced this uh, when he took office in March of 2016. Here we are almost in 2018, and we still haven't gotten underway, primarily because of the delay caused by the litigation. The, the city has, you know, started work on the program, uh, started planning, but has been reluctant to invest fully until the litigation is resolved. Hopefully that'll happen soon and hopefully we'll be able to issue bonds in January. But you know, the longer it takes, I think, there's the more potential for loss of momentum. So that's our, our story. Um, love to answer questions or provide additional information in detail. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. <coughs> What's the time frame that we're going to see? Yeah. Uh, eight years. Eight? eight years. Our grant is uh, <coughs> ten years, but the program itself is is designed to to live across two mayoral terms. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> have there been uh, sweetened beverage taxes elsewhere that have passed? What well, was your model? How would you figure that out? That's a great idea. Well, um, Philadelphia is the first big city to pass a sweetened beverage tax. New York tried it for many, many years, even with, uh, I should mention too that uh, what support we did have was from the Bloomberg Foundation in New York. They really support a lot of our advocacy. If, so if you're thinking about it, get to see Bloomberg as soon as you can. Um, Berkeley, California is the only other sort of big, like medium-sized city that has it. My understanding is now, after we passed it, a number of cities across the country are considering it. But we're the first big city to succeed. I can speak loudly. And Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the cities in the world are now committed to the climate change agenda. We need to address that. Our Philadelphia can be a world-leading city in cooperation and cooperation. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is that you Yeah, the city has a, has a big commitment to resiliency. We have uh, the other program that we're very proud of is our clean, uh, Green City Clean Waters program, which is, again, the first program to address combined sewer overflow in the country that is relying entirely on green infrastructure. Uh, we could have spent $5 billion on cisterns and piping, but by going with the green route, we think we're going to spend only $2 billion to solve our combined sewer over, over, overflow, overflow problem, but also generate other benefits, triple line benefits, new parks, new public spaces. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and um, let me be one of many to <coughs> welcome you to, back to Pittsburgh. and. Uh, now, I lived in Philadelphia in the 90s for about seven years, so I appreciate some of the things you're bringing up. Um, and I do visit 
um, recently, and I always appreciate the changes. The um, delivery method that you're concerned about, I'm just wondering what you would feel or think is a more, would be more effective. Would that be working with like the community development corporations, perhaps? It's, it's a great question. And, I, and I, I should say that my background is architecture and engineering. I came out of public infrastructure work, and I'm more accustomed to seeing centralized project leadership for big initiatives like this. I, I recommended early on the PennDOT model, which was, would be to have a master program engineer who then would be responsible for um, you know, uh, advancing projects. I'm not saying this is a bad idea. I, I would be clear about that. I just, it hasn't been tried before, and it's, it's you know, it inevitably would be more complicated because of the multiple parties involved. It, 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 you know, the Fairmount Park Conservancy, it, it, again, it, it does not have the same kind of capacity at Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. It's, it's, it's an emerging organization. It's changed a lot. But, you know, they don't have the ability to deliver dozens of projects. Um, the, fair, the free library itself has limited capacity. The city has limited capacity. So the, 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 the alternative was to go this distributed model. Find as many organizations who have some capital improvement uh, capacity as possible. It's, again, not a bad model, and in some ways it has advantages, as I mentioned, because these are organizations who are already working in those communities. And I think that was really the driving force. They wanted, they wanted to partner with organizations who knew those communities, because engagement is such a big part of it. But it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. I, 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 we, I we make a report to our board eight times a year on rebuild. This is the biggest grant we've ever, we've ever made. We've really got our, we've got our neck way out there. And, um, you know, I, I, I say to them every time we meet, this is what's happening, but be prepared for evolution. Be prepared for the program to change and evolve over time to respond to how it happens on the ground. How'd you come up with the $500 million number? Um, how did you come up with the $500 million number? That's a great question. So, so when we started, so Mike DeBerdinas came to our offices on a summer afternoon with some sketches on the back of an envelope. And he said, I talked to a guy who said, for $25 million a year, we can finance 300 million bucks. And, we, and so, and so we, we helped him think about how to expand that, how to you know, come up with other, other sources of funding. And we wanted it to be a billion. We really wanted a, you know, a, a dramatic, big number, but, and we, 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 we originally were hovering at 600 million, but 500 million was, was the number the mayor felt he could deliver. With our funding, the bond, and, the, and with a gap of 50 million, which seemed achievable over eight years. So it was really, I, I think the mayor was concerned about over-promising. But uh, yeah, we wanted it to be a billion dollar program, but just, you know, how much of that money are you saving for maintenance of the real estate assets you're developing? So it's a great question. We get it all the time. Um, rebuild is a maintenance program. It's entirely a maintenance program. We are, we are redressing the lack of investment going back decades. So there, there are four, there are four um, ways we're addressing the maintenance issue. The first is when Mike, was, Mike DeBernius was, was head of Parks and Rec, um, he did an amazing job in enhancing the maintenance capacity of the department and brought in skilled trades, and they could pretty much manage almost any project up to a million dollars in-house. Um, so there's greater capacity in the, in the system. <coughs> under, Mark's, under Mike's leadership, the budget for maintenance has been increasing. The budget for the department has been increasing over years. It had been flat for decades, if not declining. And then Rebuild is really seeking to, in the, in the renovation of these facilities, to reduce maintenance costs to make these make the facilities lower cost in, in terms of maintenance and energy and, and more energy efficient but i think the most important thing again going back to this engagement idea is that mike the mayor and mike DeBerna see this as a way to sort of engage and empower communities to advocate for more and more resources for the park system right it's a key thing is activating folks who will demand um, more resources for park and maintenance so hopefully with a combination of those four things we won't be back 25 years from now, doing it all over again? That's a great question. <coughs> How do you intend to implement the minority inclusion goals? So there's, there's two parts to the program. The one is uh, in, focused on individuals. How to expand the workforce to include more uh, folks from low-income communities. 
Uh, we're modeling on a program Penn, University of Pennsylvania has created called Penn Partners. And it's, uh, it's a program that is like a pre-apprenticeship program that has a big component around soft skills at a preparatory boot camp before you even get in the program. So it's, 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 it's working for them. Um, the advantage they have is that they have billions and billions of dollars of capital planned. We won't be able to generate that many jobs as they can, but we think the model will probably work. Uh, it also has strong support from a key city council person. But it's not just about individuals. We also are hoping to grow minority businesses. And so we are creating a fund of resources that will help small businesses with capital, insurance, uh, licensing. So the hope is that um, businesses that start the, the first to start working on small projects at the beginning of the eight years grow their capacity over the program and become more effective. We're also, we're also um, part of the funding will be used to hire project managers who are con construction companies who won't do projects. They'll just mentor small construction companies. So they won't be competing with their own subs for a uh, program. But this is a, it's, um, again, council has established very ambitious goals. Uh, we, 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 and the mayor's committed to it, but it's, it's as you're probably aware, it's a really hard thing to do. And, but I think, I, think, I think they have a, a series of good approaches to it. I do have one more question. Um, the other concern you're expressing about the slow start, is it the litigation that's slowing you down, or it, what are the issues that, are, that have prevented some of the early successes that you were looking forward to? Uh, so, well, so uh, at this point, um, uh, we're just waiting for the Supreme Court to decide if it will take up the Commonwealth Court appeal. Again, Commonwealth Court here in Pittsburgh gave a strong decision. The uh, uh, Municipal Court, the first level court uh, in Philadelphia gave a strong, a strong decision. So there's, there's two things that could happen. Council can just confirm, uh, Supreme Court can just affirm the lower court decision and then we're done, or they'll take the case up. And the expectation is that if they take the case up, uh, it'll be, it won't be before the end of the year that we get a decision, if that. So that's, that's the issue in, term, in terms of time. <clears throat> uh, thanks for my second question. Um, in your experience in the public realm and improving cities, et cetera, and with this project, if you had to pick one thing that, out of all the possible things you're looking at doing, that would catalyze change and improvement in a city in terms of people using it, in terms of the perception, the feeling, what would it be? Well, two, on a global scale, it's leadership. I mean, the, the, all of the, uh, the improvements, for example, in Center City uh, were driven by Ed Rendell and Paul Levy. Paul Levy is the head of our Center City District, our amazing business improvement. So they just, they just by force of will, they, they, they um, brought a lot of that to happen, to, to occur. But programming is the thing that really makes a difference. You can have great facilities, but if they're not animated or activated, if people don't feel welcome or engaged, that's, that's what we've really seen uh, in terms of having a big transformative effect in Philadelphia is the programming. A lot of the, a lot of the, the downtown facilities that I, I, I showed images of all existed. They were all there. They weren't well maintained and they were unprogrammed. We have a, a little park on the Delaware Riverfront called uh, Spruce Street Harbor. And it was, it's been there since the bicentennial, but it was, it was unprogrammed, um, you know, not well maintained, but with a few hundred thousand dollars of, of sort of it, they, uh, the, the, the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation turned it into a pop-up park. And the first year they did it, they got a half a million people there. And it was just hammocks, umbrellas, um, you know, big games, uh, and then food trucks and, you know, it's like a, like a, like a fake boardwalk. It was, just, it, was just, it was just activating the space. Again, it takes money, but it wasn't like it was a multi-million dollar capital program. It was all about programming. And we've seen that again and again and again throughout the city. So that's what I would suggest is, is the animation. And like, I, I had the chance to see Shetley Plaza yesterday, which to me is, is the exact model of what you're looking for. You have food, you have, you know, activities. It's, 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 that, makes, that stuff makes a difference for sure. <coughs> so are all of the, pro you showed us the table with like the 60 projects, are all of the projects kind of predetermined by the strategy and then you're looking for sponsors for implementation or is there room for new projects? So, so 
we, we think, we think with, the, with, with the budget we have in place that we'll be able to uh, tackle about half. 406 facilities, we think we could do somewhere between 150 and 200. Um, They've been prioritized based on the data. And you know, so some of, the, some of the communities that have you know, uh, experienced the most disinvestment are getting you know, the lion's share of the resources. But uh, every year, the rebuild team will release a new project list. This is the first, there'll be another one next year, and then one after that. And then we'll slowly knock away at those. Uh, among your council, did you run into and how did you overcome the um, sort of barrier of changing from an equitable distribution to this need-based distribution? Uh, and was there concern that this would be a precedent for other funding c from the, you know, the government? It's, it's a great question. And um, the truth is, again, that um, while well, it is a big shift, right? For example, uh, Brian O'Neill is the councilman for the 10th uh, district. He would have gotten six projects under the old program, but under the new program, he's only getting two. But that's above and beyond what he would get normally under the old capital program. So everybody gets something. It's, it's additive. So that was, the, that was the carrot to council, that they'll get the usual you know, capital enhancement, but this is in, above. So everybody gets something more. And I think, I think you know, the mayor <clears throat> was convincing that, you know, folks, we've, we've got to invest in these facilities that are, that are terrible, and everyone sort of understood that. Um, so, there, so council has bought into the equity approach. But again, truthfully, everybody gets something. No one's going to be left out in, in the cold. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Have you been able to address externalities? and get money from less people in prison because you have now increased the quality of life in schools and education, and therefore you should get money from less people going to prison. Well, I don't have good data on that. Um, you need it, you need it, because uh, there are examples. The South Bronx mm -hmm. and Steve Ritz, you can get some data. And you could look at those data for Philadelphia. And this is a big issue in America. We have the largest prison population in the world per, per total income. We, we you know, certainly appreciate that. And, and you know, education is a big focus of our foundation. And uh, um, it's, a it's a huge issue for Philadelphia. Uh, we are still under state control, as, you, as you're probably aware. Um, but there have been improvements. You know, it, it, you, usually you only hear bad news about Philadelphia public schools. But the truth is, the high school graduation rate has gone from 50% 17 years ago to almost 70%. So there is improvement. It's just, you know, we still have a long way to go. And, um, you know, like a lot of places, there are better schools, you know, in Center City and in the areas around that, and then in other areas, the are, schools aren't quite as good. So it's a big challenge. It's another area of, of, of interest of our foundation. As someone who's uh, worked in support of both parks and libraries, I was very interested to see how you had mapped um, both of them as community assets. You know, they're both are um, democratic spaces where everybody is welcome. So I'm just wondering if there have been any particular synergies with bringing those two assets mm -hmm. together in any of the projects? That's, that's a great question. So I didn't dive down too much into sort of the program design, but, um, one of the factors which uh, will enhance the prioritization of a facility is if it's a multi-use facility. And there's about, I think the number is, there's about 40 um, multi-use facilities in the city, basically a park, a rec center, and a library, co-located. And we think those are places where transformative impacts could occur. So those places are getting a higher, are getting more attention, and we're, we're, we're trying to assign more design thinking to those places because they seem to create the most opportunity for like new community clusters as opposed to just fixing a boiler, returfing a field, or fixing a roof. Oh, I'm good, thanks. Fol following on from, oh, over, so over here. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, <coughs> following on from the question about incarceration rates, what is the 
what's the relationship between some of the great organizations you have in Philadelphia who do workforce readiness, like Power Core? Mm -hmm. Is there a role for them in this process? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we've already have some track record in that, which we hope to, to build on. We have a great program called Roots to Reentry which is a program designed to bring returning citizens in, back into, uh, uh, into the workforce. And it's led by the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, which is a tremendous organization, about to celebrate its 200th, 200th, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, about to celebrate its 200th anniversary. And uh, it's designed to use landscape horticulture as a means to reintroduce uh, folks into the workforce. But there are, other, there are other programs as well. That's just one example. I have a question. Um, in the city of Pittsburgh, the last few years, we have some of the same issues with infrastructure and challenges. We really upgraded our programming with our recreational staff. Is the city going to make a similar commitment towards the um, you know, staffing side in terms as it relates to programming? You talked about the experience underneath the, uh, at the pier and at the bridge. Yep. Um, but are you what are you doing to raise the bandwidth mm -hmm. or the interest level or the expectation level in those underserved communities about what's possible mm -hmm. right now, even with their, you know, our, and, and with our, again, crumbling facilities that we have and Philadelphia has as well? A couple, couple of thoughts about that. Uh, um, the first is that uh, in re, um, reinventing our Parks and Rec Department, um, Mike, uh, now Catherine, um, sees engagement not sees the engagement effort not as uh, how do you engage people uh, from the community, but also how do you retrain the entire workforce of, the, especially the recs department, which has a lot of contact with communities, how do they become agents of engagement? How do they, instead of just handing out you know, soccer balls or you know, turning the lights on the facility, how, the, how do they become uh, representatives of the department and work with communities to program their facilities together? In other words, this is, this is, this is, this is uh, an, an element of Mike's idea about this engagement compact, that it's not just the citizens who bear the responsibility. The city itself has to rethink the way it engages. And so collectively, folks, community members, rec department, parks department, will work together to program and um, you know, rethink how facilities are used. Um, the, other, the other thing I would, I would mention is that um, there's a big role for nonprofits in the work. And while the Philadelphia Parks and Rec Department has really uh, become very, has strengthened significantly, the truth is that almost all new park facilities in, in Philadelphia are being built in partnerships with non private nonprofits. So for example, the Center City District, the Schuylkill River Development Corporation, the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, University City District at Penn, and the Fairmount Park Conservancy. So <coughs> I, I cannot think right now of a new park space that's been created in Philadelphia the last 10 years that was done just by the city. So we're, we're, we're trying to encourage that in areas outside of downtown. Where can, for example, the Conservancy, which used to be just focused on Center City and the riverfronts, how can we expand their role in working with neighborhoods outside of downtown in terms of programming and, and park enhancement? You know, can we, where we can earn revenue in our big regional parks, how can that revenue be transferred to support parks where revenue isn't possible to support programming in those places. So that's the, that's the approach that we're taking. It's still taking shape, but um, the, city, the city really does, and Mike especially, does have a commitment to program. He just doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't think this can end with bricks and mortar. If, that, if we just build these facilities and walk away, that will be a successful program. But if, we walk, but if, if there's an engaged community who's excited about the program, the facilities are stewarding them, that's the kind of goals we're looking for. Hi, um, I'm <coughs> curious about the uh, connections, where you see connections and to what degree between this program and your program to implement green infrastructure in the city. So um, another factor that prioritizes uh, investments in rebuild is the extent to which they advance green city clean water program, which is our, as I mentioned earlier, is our, is our combined sewer overflow program. So the parks are a great opportunity to do that. And there's um, part of the rebuild team. Uh, we have a, a director um, of design who is liaison with the water department to make sure that you know, the, 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 the goals of that program are embedded in rebuild. We've also, as a condition of our grant, I didn't mention this, but our $100 million grant came with a bill of rights 
level of conditions. You know, we make a grant, we might make one condition. This had 10 conditions. And one of them was to advance sustainability through rebuild, to ensure that there was a connection between the work we were supporting uh, in rebuild and the work we're supporting through Green City Clean Water. Yeah, that, that was a factor, and, and, and again, I, I didn't uh, dive too deeply, but there was a, an analysis of population movement. Uh, we, uh, we probably do have too many rec centers. If I, I can say that out of town, right? I can say it in Pittsburgh. If I go to, if I go to Philadelphia, I, I would get hung. We have, two, we have 156 rec centers, and they're just, there's just too many of them, and some of them are very small. And so, our, our, so, you know, just to tell a quick story, when Mayor Nutter became mayor, he, he looked at the facility, like the library, and he said, you know what, on a per capita basis, Philadelphia has too many libraries. And he tried to close 11 branches. That almost ended his mayoralty right there, and no branches were closed. So our, our, our hope is that as we enhance facilities, as, new, as you know, important facilities come online and they're, and they're transformed, that it'll be easier to deaccession facilities that aren't quite, you know, functional or, or provide as much services. That's gonna be a, a fight though. I mean, these, these, you know, these rec centers, and I'm sure it's true here in Pittsburgh, I mean, they, they're, they are deeply connected to the community. They're political organizations. They're, they're you know, the councilman is, is, in, is, is invested in these facilities. So they're hard, they're hard, to, they're hard to change. But we do, we do recognize that at some point we're gonna to have to do some consolidation. It's just a hard, a hard thing to do, for sure. Oh, sure. I'll get off stage. I want to thank Sean so much for coming. And just um, one more thought about equity in case people don't know. The regional asset district has been a great boon to the parks in the city of Pittsburgh, as we all know. But I'm not sure that everybody knows that there are 160 parks in the park system and only five of the 160 are eligible for RAD support because the way the legislation was written 25 years ago, a park was defined as 200 acres or more. So um, not just something like McKinley Park in Belts Hoover, but also Mellon Square downtown are just not eligible for RAD funding. So that gives us a, a serious problem about trying to keep and get all of the parks in the park system up to a good level of quality. So we hope to have all of your support at the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy going forward. But I, I can't thank Sean enough for um, wanting to come out here and share this really exciting story with us. And um, he's just a prince of a fellow. And uh, thank you so much and every success with your rebuild program. Thanks again. <laughs>